grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. You're not the boss of me. Uh, and, and, and if you have children, you've heard it from your little ones. And you hope that uh, long time before they hear it from their children, they come to understand that parents have authority over you. Because that's where we learn to deal with authority. Now, it's beneficial for the children and for society as a whole if they have a family that is disciplined. Uh, that's how God designed it because he is ultimately in charge and he gave to parents the authority to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And those who are able by God's grace to do that, their children are better off in relationship to God and in relationship to their fellow men. You can draw the implications of how our culture in the last lifetime has changed that paradigm such that Families have been destroyed. The concept of family has been expanded to, it's the community, and the community sets the standards, regardless of where the children are. And now it's to the point that it's chaos. It's chaos. But God is still in charge. God is still in charge, and he has, <laughs> see, this is what we must trust. God is working good out of all the chaos for those whom he has called and who have been serving him. Those who have answered the call, accepted the call, have become his children by faith. God is working good. And in the text today, the, the, Isaiah, this is what, let me read you, follow along there, uh, the, first, the first part of the verse. I'm, I'm going to change one word. I'm going to change that word to the Hebrew, because you of all should be very familiar with this word. Let me read. The first verse of Isaiah 45, verse 1 again. Yeah. Thus says the Lord to his Messiah, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. It's the first part. Cyrus, Jesus is Messiah. I thought Jesus was the Messiah. <laughs> yeah, well, he was the Messiah. <laughs> he was the Messiah. Messiah. Cyrus was a Messiah, but he wasn't of the house and lineage of David. He wasn't a descendant of Abraham. He wasn't a child of promise. He was a Persian. Persia, that, uh, for those who are a little down on their uh, geography and their history, uh, that's Iraq, Iran, Iran, Persia. And Cyrus was the one who led the Persians into conquering their full world, including the Medes, who were their competitors for a long time. But they conquered the Medes as well. So that today, even today, after Several centuries, you hear of the law, the Medes and the Persians, because that's how strong they were for hundreds of years. And Cyrus, but see, the strange part about Isaiah saying that 
is that Isaiah died about 150 years before Cyrus was born. And people who are looking for things to discredit the scriptures say that there's no way that, of course, and we agree, there's no way that that Isaiah could have known that Cyrus was going to be king of the Persians. There's no way, except the way it was, which was God told him, and God had him write it down. See, for the last 50, 60 years or more, uh, maybe longer than that now, it's just, in fact, let's say the last 100 years, <laughs> I keep adding to what I learned all this stuff, and that was 50 years ago. Okay. They have said, to try to explain it, they said there was just, there was one Isaiah, but then there was another one who built on that, and another one who built on that. The, one, the other one, you know, about every 50 to 75 years or so, there was a, there was a new person who took on the persona and, and the role of the prophet Isaiah. And that's how the writings conclude this stuff that historically didn't happen until a long time after Isaiah was dead. Because... The acquired sinful nature of man does not want to acknowledge the authority and the power of God to the point that when Paul was witnessing and spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, who the only thing about God that they had were the myths that they had created as to who and what was in charge above them. And their stories were always developed in such a way that, if, if, that they were confusing as to, as to <laughs> who really was in charge because everybody was manipulating everybody else, including if we could figure out how to do that, we were going to do that. Well, so this whole process, God knows. And God told Isaiah, and he wrote it down. Because there were other things that God told Isaiah and the other prophets about the Messiah who was coming. And that was hundreds of years, a thousand years before the time of it actually happening. Because that's the way that God works. He wants his people to know what's coming And here's the other good news. The last part that I read, his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. It's Cyrus, right hand is always the hand of power. That's why we talk about Christ's throne is sitting at the right hand of God. That's that's a a writer's way of, of, of expressing the power. Because most of humanity is right-handed, that's their dominant hand, etc., etc., etc. And so, just the concept is, sitting at his right-hand man was Jesus, except that this is right-hand man God. <laughs> and, and now he's taken the hand whose right hand God has grasped of Cyrus, or like this. And he says, come on, Cyrus. He says, you don't know me, but I named you. I named you hundreds of years ago because I know. God knows. The omniscient one. The omnipotent one. The omnipresent one. Yeah. And God says, okay, Cyrus, you're going to you're just going to run rampant. And it got all kinds of things. To open doors before him, the gates may not be closed. I will go for you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. That was the gates of Babylon. That was the gate of Babylon. Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. You, you've heard of him. And, and they had this huge gate, 
And, and when the bars came down, they were bars of iron. You, know, you couldn't get in there if you closed the doors, among a lot of other things. And God says, uh, going to be a piece of cake for you, Cyrus. You're going to win. You're going to win. And he led them. Why? See, why? Because it was time for the captivity of Israel to be over in Babylon. And so Cyrus was the savior of the people in Babylon because he not only freed them from rule in Babylon, but those who wanted to go back to Israel, to the promised land, and oh, by the way, there were a lot who were well ensconced in, in socioeconomically in Babylon and decided to stay there. They didn't go home. But those who went back, Cyrus is the one who made sure that all the temple vessels and everything else that belonged to them that were held in storage as trophies by the Babylonians were given back to them to take home. And money to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple when they got back home. That was Cyrus. The Persian, the Persian, the Messiah, not the Messiah, but a Messiah of Israel. And so God's working that. And you need to remember that story, particularly this month and next month, because I know my faith in trust in God is being challenged because we think, I don't know either side of the political realm this day that can fathom how they're going to continue on if their opponent wins. But God's people live under God and under whatever government they are under. Because whatever it is, God is working for us for some reason. He left the people of Israel in captivity and Babylon for a long time. But it was time to remove them and send them back home because the land had been promised and that's where the Messiah was to be born. And it was time to get them home so that they can establish their, themselves again in a, a half a millennia so that they can prepare things for the coming of the Messiah in that little outskirts of Beth, uh, Bethlehem near Jerusalem. Uh, it's, it's all God's plan works together. And, and it's because there's a plan and he has it. And it's, it's, it's our trust in him that he has a plan and he's going to carry it out. And there are things in there, oh, that you question, what, how do we explain that when he says, you know, uh, last part, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity? Does that mean he makes bad things happen? No. He's created everything, but everything is tainted by sin, including all of his creation. And so there's chaos involved. And at, he stops bad things from happening when he knows that, there's, that those people who would be whatever gone through or killed, this is not time for them yet. And so he, he lets bad things happen, not to test, to challenge, to get us ready for even worse things. You hear that to say, this is the most important election in... 
every four years, you hear the same thing. Because for those people, it is. For the rest of us, we try to adapt. (laughs) Some are better at it than others, but we all have to. But what, what about the times when, when it's not going well? What about, you know, well, see, Jesus' day, it really wasn't, it was okay. And, and the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the people of, of Israel, uh, they, had, uh, they, had, they had positioned themselves in relationship to the governing authority, i.e. Pilate. Uh, they had it, they, they were, there were some ways that they were in control. If you read uh, uh, Paul Meyer's book uh, on Pilate and, and other uh, of, the, of that time frame, you know, uh, <clears throat> Pilate was of a uh, was a friend of Caesar. Uh, that was the club. That was the inside club to be a friend of Caesar. And they had stuff on Pilate, and they already sent Caesar some letters. See that they kind of had Pilate. And, and were manipulating him uh, because they could cause rioting that, and, and cause trouble for Pilate that would, would uh, uh, get back to uh, Caesar that Pilate wasn't governing well. It usually it was a lie, but it accomplished the purpose because Pilate was weary, uh, wary of their being, uh, weary too, but he was wary of what they might do on this particular week when this question came up. And, and the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, they were desperate. They knew that so far they really didn't have anything on Jesus to, to warrant being executed by the Romans. And since Pilate was in town, they couldn't take it into their own hands. They didn't have the authority from Pilate to execute anybody when Pilate was in town. And he was in town that week. Why? Because it was time for the Passover. And every year they had a threat. They were on DEFCON 4, uh, which is high alert because of the possibility of rebellion by these Jews in Jerusalem on the Passover. Well, so they tried another angle. It says, uh, they come, they figured, that we got this one, boy. We give it, it's got to be a yes or no answer, right? We got to get, because it's, you know, it's either Caesar or it's God. You can't have both, they felt. Because, see, they didn't understand. <laughs> For them, it was only one. And, So they ask him the good question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus called him right off. He says, what? Why do you put me to the test? Why do you put me to the test? You hypocrites! Show me the coin. They reached in, and they pulled out a denarius. Uh, They were in the temple. The only coins in the temple, besides where the money changers were, who took all the coins with the images of any other ruler on it, because no one was permitted to have images of anything except those things representing God himself, the cherubim, angels, so forth, so on, but not anything else because there are no other. You are, there, to Cyrus, there, there are no other gods. There are no others. And so it was illegal, immoral, improper for the Pharisees to reach into their money purse and pull out a coin of the realm. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. 
Do as I say, not as I do. Does that sound familiar? These laws apply to you. They don't apply to me. Okay. Does that sound familiar? All right. They showed him the coin. And, he, and what did he tell them? Uh, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and give to God the things that belong to God. <laughs> How do you determine what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar? Well, Caesar's image is on that coin. That must be at least, well, that's the taxes. So we pay the taxes. You know, they had to turn in their Caesar coins and get temple coins to pay the temple tax. <laughs> Where was it? The Jesus, uh, was, was, who was he with? It was with Peter. And it was time to go to the temple. And he, he tells Peter, says, go over there and grab that fish. Uh, there's two temple coins in there. <laughs> we go get those for us so we can go to the temple and pay our temple tax as we go in. And Peter goes over, grabs that fish, dumps the two temple coins out of it, and takes it. <laughs> These little stories, as they intertwine and go back and forth, it's fascinating. That's why God wants you to study the scriptures is because all these little things that tie together and it's like, wow, all right, what a neat thing. And, and, and the older I get and the more I get into the scriptures, the more excited I get about all those little tiny things that tie together and because God's in, he's wrapped all that together and wow, he must have a real brain going there. <laughs> yeah, omniscient. Well, okay. So, you know, our task is God, God works through. Humanity, because of sin, needs a structure. Uh, we've said so often before. The first things that anarchists do who are against rule, they're against the rule of the present. And so they do everything to destroy the rule of the present. They want to destroy it. Get rid of, you know, whatever documentation. Get rid of whoever, if, if, if it's a, a king or somebody that's, 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 that's declaring what is the law and the rule, they would get rid of that. And, and free the populace from that. But it's within a matter of days that they institute their own set of rules. And you better obey them because they're in charge now. Man needs rules. And God puts people, everyone who has been, has, God has permitted these people to become the rulers. The most horrid rulers who have killed millions of their people. God permitted them to be there. Why? I don't know. You got to do a real study of the consequences and what happened and how, how history. You have to back off from, and take a look at the totality of history in order to come up with that. Uh, not my avocation, <laughs> but enough of it to say you can find what God's doing from that. You can find, and He opens it up to us from the examples of like with Cyrus and others. Okay, well, mm, okay. The problem is, is that not all, well, all rulers are still sinners like the rest of us. And they stand before God condemned. The problem is if they don't humble themselves before God, recognizing that God has named them, God has given them the power and extend their right hand that God might lead them through their rule like Solomon did. Wisdom of Solomon. What got him all those riches and all that other kind of stuff? He asked for God to guide him as king of his people. And those who ask God's guidance and give God to glory for his guidance are more likely than not those who are humbled before God, even if not necessarily before humanity, but in the quietness of their prayers to God, humility before God, and say, God, help me. 
with this. As each of us says, God, you have given me resources. Help me to use these resources. And for those who do not extend their right hand to God for help, and they tell you to do things that are contrary to God's word, then you are no longer responsible to obey those laws. I, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I, Peter, and the apostles, I, Paul, all who challenged the authority of his day, who told them to be quiet. Don't talk of this Jesus of Nazareth. You have a duty as a Christian to disobey those rules. When they tell you to murder people whom are not in your, they're not handy anymore. You're not ready to have a baby. You're not ready to take care of your elders. They're a burden. This person is too sick. Let's just pull the plug. Let's give them, let's give them morphine and, and, and let them die in peace. Disobey the sinful laws of the authorities in heaven. Obey. We had an, oh, I have a video for the confirmation kids, and it's a young man whose father is, obviously has a great problem with his alcohol. And in the influence of the alcohol, he badgers his son to go to the store and buy beer. The son's under age. Beer and cigarettes he wants. Now, go, get out of here. This is, well, you're a Christian. Aren't you supposed to obey your parents? Not when they tell me to do things like that. That doesn't mean that you're going to get the you-know-what knocked out of you-know-where for disobeying your dad. Doesn't mean when you disobey the authorities that you may not be paying a fine or going to jail. You may well be. Paul went, spent a lot of time in prison. Look at the great letters he wrote from there with great enthusiasm and rejoicing. Remember, that's where he said, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. I said, always, and again I say, rejoice in prison. <laughs> because the authorities are not perfect. And they tell us to do things that are contrary to God. But they're also there to try to keep the peace so that, generally speaking, people can function as a community. God's in charge, folks. And it ain't easy living here because the only rose garden in our future is in heaven. Except sometimes, by God's grace, he gives us a glimpse. And, and we, can, we get a vacation from our usual. And we're able to back off and say, oh, this is nice. For a day or two out of a 10-day vacation, and then you got to say, well, now, I, now I've had my break. Now it's time to think about getting back to the drudge of things. Or, you know, we come here, and we get a moment's rest of peace as we're fed by the Word and the sacraments. And then we have to get up from this place and go back into the world where we live. God has your right hand. And he will lead you against his enemies. And we know who wins the war. Because the war is over. Christ won. And he's coming to take his soldiers back to heaven with him. And that we can live and we can die in peace. Because we are living eternally with him in heaven. Amen.